So welcome everybody to this July seminar hosted by Odler. Uh, my name is Sarah Stein and I'm on the executive of the Odler Committee. Um, if, in case you're not aware, Odler is the Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia and um, we have close connections with the Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand and with ICDE, which is the International Council on Distance Education. Um, one of the star attractions of Odla is its journal, and that's called Distance Education. Um, we often have the editor of that journal with us, but he's not here today, unfortunately. Perhaps he'll join us. And many of the topics of our webinar series are presented by authors who have published in the journal, and today is no exception. Um, I'd like to in introduce you to one of the authors of a really interesting article published in the November 21 issue. That's correct, isn't it, Greta? That's right, yeah. So welcome Greta Moran, who is a research officer at the Economic and Social uh, Research Institute in Dublin, and also an assistant professor at Trinity College, Dublin. The article is called Home Broadband and Student Engagement During COVID-19 Emergency Remote Teaching. We are seeing lots of reports in the literature about education um, during the pandemic and being able to read research, such as the research that Greta will talk to us about in a moment, causes us to focus our attention um, on the factors relating to, to people, systems and technologies. And these are all critical components that have to be really well crafted and thought about if a distance education system is to be effective for teachers, for students, and for the institutions as well. And those critical factors tend to be the very ones that in non-crisis times are easily taken for granted. They're ignored, some often not even noticed at all as being very important, and yet they really are very important. So I'll now hand over to Greta to lead us through the presentation. Um, please feel free to add any comments or questions in the chat as we go along, and um, we'll attempt to make sure that they're they responded to either during the session or at the end. Um, so over to you, Greta. Thanks, Sarah. And I assume we're all good on, on, on screens and, and, um, and, and audio. Um, so that was a very comprehensive, um, challenging and thought provoking introduction. Um, so thanks for that. Um, yes, as Sarah mentioned, this is a paper that we, the research was undertaken um, in the midst of the chaos of the pandemic, certainly here in Ireland um, during the first wave of, of COVID here. Um, and it concerned the um, shutdown of the schools, um, secondary schools, and um, the move overnight to, to distance learning. And that's certainly not been a feature of the Irish uh, school system up to this point. Um, so it's been a real learning experience. Normal schooling has resumed. Um, I see something in the chat. Hello, Angela. <laughs> um, and this is a paper that I've been doing with my, my colleagues, Kieran and Selena, that was published last year. All right, so next slide. I'm stuck here for some reason. All right, let me see why this is not going forward. Sorry, guys. Oh, that's perfectly all right, Greta. Um, I'm screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Slide. All right, yeah, we're in business again. Okay. Um, so April 2020, uh, pandemic, of course, first happened in, in March 2020, as we know. And April 2020, there was um, nationwide school closures in uh, over 188 countries um, globally. So. It's been a real um, international experience, and we've seen this rapid shift to distance uh, learning um, from the home environment. Um, there is some um, debate, as you'll know, in, in your journals and in your academic fields as to the, the distance learning definition and even in the term distance itself. Um, but what we've used in this paper certainly is is the understanding that distance learning is an education setting in which the student and instructor are not physically co-present in the same location all right so our study investigation um it was motivated just by the events uh, unique events that had happened 
Um, and we really wanted to understand uh, the impact of this transition in learning, this whole new style of learning um, on student engagement. And student engagement is sort of multi-dimensional, um, you know, concept. Um, there's three sort of domains, um, it, you know, considered. Um, the first one is the behavioral one, which which we focus on in this um, research, which would concern, you know, the, the level of participation of of the student and um, their you know, degree of attention in applying themselves uh, to the education and the efforts shown uh, while learning or being taught. But there's also um, sort of emotional uh, dimension to it where that might concern more like interactions between students and their peers or teachers uh, and also a sense of belonging. And then there's a third um, dimension of, of cognitive engagement where it's more like self-directed uh, and engaged uh, learning by the student. So the type of engagement we're concerned with really is, is this behavioural um, participatory um, dimension. And we're interested in um, the availability of high speed broadband. Um, now, why we're interested in that in particular availability is we have this major policy in Ireland um, which has been somewhat controversial up to the up to the pandemic, where it's costing three billion to roll out um, high speed broadband to rural areas. So um, before the pandemic, this was kind of seen as superfluous and, and you know um, a, a great expense on taxpayers. But I think there's been a slight um, change in public attitude, and, and more people have actually. Uh, relocated to rural areas so so in a sense this policy is um, not as controversial as it once was but in saying that costs continue to escalate and uh, it's always part of the the policy debate here in Ireland and um, particularly in in regard to how some of it was procured and, and the governance of it um, and then ICT devices in a sense in as far as we can we can proxy those in the study and I'll describe that later the application that we're you know we're looking at is secondary education so that's from um 12 to 18 years uh, secondary education is mandatory up to 16 in ireland um and uh, you know there's the final year is a very important exam year so this is why we were particularly interested in in secondary education as opposed to say primary or, or third level um, and yeah the, the findings that we have you know do have policy considerations before um the pandemic even the european commission um had recognized the value of, of distance learning and uh, puts that as the reason for um, having these major uh, infrastructure investments in high-speed broadband. Um, and then at the national level, uh, I've just described uh, some of the uh, debates and, and news and everything that's generated around this topic. All right, so in terms of our research question, um, we asked, you know, is student access to high-speed broadband or to ICT devices at home? in the household um, associated with the impact of the shift to distance learning on student engagement. So just very briefly, um, what has been the literature up to this point when, when we were doing the study? Um, the first dimension, there's three strands, and, and the first is the impact of the school, school closure. So when we were undertaking this research, it was May 2020, the schools had closed for two months and say i think the first report on this was released in june at uh, the end of june so um and then by the time we we did peer review and everything like that there was a small body of research um you know concerned with covid at the time and the first sort of publications uh, had various estimates of of learning loss and it was predicted in particular um maths uh, would suffer in terms of learning at secondary level and also reading scores would be 
half as likely and this sort of thing. There was definitely, um, I'm sure it's the case in New Zealand and Australia and elsewhere, a huge um, emphasis on how this is affecting kids in terms of their health and well-being, uh, the loss of the school, um, you know, place as a, as a forum for interaction with peers and also uh, for disadvantaged um, students, the home environment may not be um, ideal. And then... As I say, uh, the, the effects of all of this are, are were predicted to be and, and shown to be, as we know, um, more acute among disadvantaged um, background students. So those from low income families or, or for, you know, students whose parents um, didn't necessarily, you know, attain a high degree of education. All right, so the effectiveness of distance learning is another strand of the literature relevant to this um, work. And um, up till the pandemic, there was there was some body of literature um, on distance learning, but a lot of it probably focused at the third level, um, university level uh, education setting. So open universities and, and universities in the, in the air or whatever, uh, colleges. Um, these were comparisons of, of undertaking modules and lessons with classroom based education and I think there was mostly uh, there was a, a sense from the literature that uh, distance learning can be effective for this uh, cohort of of older and maybe mature students um, but there was some some debate within that and you know the effectiveness of distance learning was um, thought to be you know influenced by, uh, I, I just see some comments, I'll get to them at the end, you know, the student characteristics in terms of their own uh, ability to, uh, you know, regulate their learning, to be motivated, um, to undertake the lessons in, in their own time. And then in terms of the lesson delivery factors, uh, some literature would show that more live, uh, you know, concurrent um synchronous um, lessons were more effective than the likes of a, you know, asynchronous um, in their own time uh, education. So that was the state of play. And once again, this is stopped. Why is that? No worries, Greta. It happens all the time, these things. <laughs> I don't understand why this is happening now, but in any case... Don't worry. It's fine. I'm going to have to maybe bear with this coming in out. So let me share screen. And this is the third um, strand of the literature concerned with student engagement itself. So that is, is a lot to do with, um, in the literature, strong student-teacher relations, um, a positive school climate, a school ethos that is very encouraging of the students and some evidence prior to the pandemic was that ICT, the use of that in the classroom, um, allows for more collaborative, um, you know, approaches to lesson delivery and, and um, engagement by students. So getting to our study, um, the data uh, this was primary uh, research uh, where we, um, upon the pandemic, designed a, designed a survey and certainly, um, needless to say, in the environment that it was, it was an online survey. And we had emailed, we have good connections at the Research Institute with the National Association for Principals and Deputy Principals, um, which is an association of, of secondary school leaders in Ireland. and we administered the survey through the email contacts we have there in May 2020. And it was a it was a crazy time for principals as they tried to have a continuation, a continuity of, of the school environment in this time. So um, some principals were very receptive of, of the research and others were like, I just don't have time. And so 
in the end uh, of over 723 um, secondary schools in Ireland, we received 234 responses. So that's one in three um, principals had responded to the survey in the end. We sent a couple of um, reminders and such like that. And then with missingness to or skipping uh, some of the survey questions, we end up with an analytical sample of 206 schools. And that was the quantitative arm of, of this study. We had also then followed up um, with a qualitative interviews uh, with 10 school principals from you know, an, a, a sample of, of uh, a variety of schools across the country in terms of their structural characteristics, their disadvantage level and, and this sort of thing to get um, a bit of color on, on the statistics. So it was a mixed method study, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the qualitative interviews at the moment in this particular uh, paper. Um, so we have these responses from the secondary school leaders, our primary survey, and we um, imputed, so we, we, we linked the data, we have the school's addresses, and we linked the data from the uh, principals to um, information that we have on this high-speed broadband um, availability across the country. So we linked it to the National Broadband Plan map for 2019, the most recent um, mapping of that infrastructure. And also the information we have from since 2016 on the mean gross household income in the electoral district. And the school catchment areas were defined um, according to rurality. So in urban areas, we drew sort of um, based on the National Transport Survey and the Growing Up in Ireland Survey, eight uh, kilometre, uh, I know New Zealand and dis, uh, is very different in terms of geographical size and Australia as well to Ireland, but we had eight kilometre radius around the schools that was sort of proxy for the catchment areas and um, for rural areas, it was 24 kilometers. So, so this was the best uh, inf information we had at the time and, and what we did at that time. So I've mentioned the, the very controversial national broadband plan. And I just noticed in the chat, someone said that 3 billion doesn't sound like a huge, okay, huge amount of money. And in Australia, a figure of 43 billion is discussed. Wow, well, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, Australia has the outback and everything like that. Maybe the size of Ireland is probably like a tiny county in, in Australia. I'm not quite sure. Um, but, but costs are escalating. So I'm sure it's possibly going to be more like 5 billion in the end up till 2027, 26, that they want to have this uh, high speed broadband coverage universally available. And we also have, you know, certain. I don't know about the case in Australia, but certain uh, rules and regulations to follow as part of the European uh, Union, um, which, which might differ. Anyways, so this is the map of Ireland, the Republic, um, and what we have in the green areas is, is a typically urban areas where high speed broadband is available. In the yellow areas, there's in the in the zoomed in map you can see there's little squiggles of yellow areas and there is no high speed broadband in those areas just yet but a commercial company is planning rollout and then in the orange the rest of the country which is rural areas uh, there is no high speed broadband available um, and no commercial company plans to uh, provide it because it's not maybe profitable. So that's where um, state intervention is required in the orange areas. So for the purposes of this study, we're comparing the green where high-speed broadband is available in 2019 with the rest of the country where it's not available. Once again, I can't believe this. This has stopped moving forward. So we're gonna have to just improvise here once again. Share screen. And from our current slide, uh, we see that the outcome variables, the variables, the dependent variables that we're interested in, I've mentioned student engagement. Um, so the principals were asked to rate the impact of school building closures on student engagement relative to in-person education. So there's a five-point scale. 
Um, and how we actually ended up framing this was, um, so it ranges from much better, better, similar, worse, much worse. We, we framed it in terms of the negative, um, worse or much worse. And 69.9% of principals had reported that the um, student engagement was, was worse. We took some, some various different groups within that, the student engagement of third years, which were doing state exams, um, the junior certificate, um, and this final year um, state exams, uh, the leaving cert. We also looked at the delivery of lesson content and, and student um, attendance as outcomes. And these are all framed in the negative sense. And, you know, by and large, uh, apart from delivery of lesson content, you know, more than 50% of, of, of this surveyed principles um, had said that uh, things were worse on those fronts. In terms of our quantitative approach, we have a logistic regression. On the left-hand side, uh, we're measuring the probability of the principal reporting worse engagement as a function of this high-speed broadband um, variable income, which is a proxy for the uh, devices available in the house and all the other factors in the X um, adjust for key school characteristics, which might um, influence policy scheme for disadvantaged schools that get extra funding and grants um, whether there's the, their private fee paying or Irish language medium which can attract slightly um, more uh, affluent um, students and the level of, of technology uh, used prior to the pandemic. All right so um, just in terms of the results so our outcome is the negative impact on student engagement and we have odds ratios uh, reported. So high speed broadband availability um, where the catchment area we're comparing where there's um, pretty much universal more than 90 percent of residents have high speed broadband available because you need a certain degree for this um, sort of live teaching and, and distance teaching to be viable, I suppose. Um, we're comparing those with, with, with um, catchment areas which have uh, less than, um, less than uh, universal uh, availability of high-speed broadband. Um, and what we find is that where high-speed broadband is, is, is greater available, there is a three time, uh, where high-speed broadband is not available, there's a three times more likely a higher odds ratio of the principal reporting a negative impact on student engagement. And peculiarly, the um, proxy that we um, use for ICT devices in the home, uh, catchment uh, average income, in thinking that higher average income, more uh, devices, um, we actually find a higher odds of um, a negative impact on student engagement there. And I'll speak about the reasons why we think that um, in the discussion section. So this is the table that's reported in the paper. So it's only, uh, you know, I've mentioned those five outcome measures, overall student engagement, the engagement for the two exam years and the delivery of lesson content um, didn't seem to be uh, registered as, um, influenced by, by this uh, availability of high-speed broadband or not, and student atten attendance. Um, so where there was poorer high-speed broadband as well, we see um, a two times higher odds of um, poorer student at attendance. And apart from you know, those, those log of catchment areas, that proxy for ICT devices, also um, seems to be higher across the specifications. Whenever we think about distance learning, we also inquired as to the various methods employed um, from the uh, principals for uh, most or all classes in the end. Um, and we just, this diagram shows the different six different 
is it six, one, two, three, four, five, six different um, approaches uh, and those split according to high, uh, high speed broadband availability. So we see where we have high speed broadband availability in the teal blue color, um, you know, there was more uh, deployment of, of, of live video and, and pre-recorded video and, and the likes of that. Um, than, than areas where there was a poor uh, coverage of, of high-speed broadband. All right, so then whenever we model that as a right-hand side variable, uh, the various approaches to um, learning and their impact on student engagement. The negative impact on student engagement from whenever we estimate live video was half as likely, more than half as likely. So um, where you have live video um, principles were, were much less, uh, statistically much less likely to import, uh, report a negative impact on student engagement. All right, so just to summarize <laughs> the results, um, what we've seen in this uh, research is that the availability of broadband, high-speed broadband is associated um, with a lower probability of reduced student engagement. Um, there's a lower probability of reduced engagement where schools use live video teaching. Um, and there is some evidence of a relationship with average household income, but we're gonna explain now, there might be some curious factors in, in, in that, in that uh, well, first of all, just taking the results on the exam classes. So we, we saw that there was really no statistical evidence of a relationship with the exam classes um, from the broadband measure. Um, and we were thinking about this and, and inquired with principals about the, the meaning of this result. And, and it was really felt that the impact of student engagement for these group was mainly affected by the cancellation of state exams. So this is a cohort specific factor and um, that probably influenced, uh, you know, diminished the influence of, of whether broadband was available or not, or not. And then I've mentioned that null result on higher, or sorry, the, the um, counterintuitive result on higher average household incomes, where, where there is higher average incomes and they're much, uh, more likely to report worse student engagement. Um, so what we thought that was, and, and certainly informed by principles, was it, that was to do with the perception of change. So the expectations for good student engagement are much higher in um, affluent areas. And then with the pandemic, the drop in that was probably a lot uh, greater than the rest of the country um, and parents in these schools uh, you know in affluent areas have greater expectations of schools to, to maintain engagement and, and school leadership as well so um, that, that it's probably picking up those effects more than uh, the ICT devices in homes and principals couldn't directly comment on you know, ICT devices in homes, in a sense. So in terms of the overall uh, strengths of this analysis, at the time, you know, obviously it was, it was done at a particular snapshot in time, and certainly we've reflected on, on the approach since then. Um, but we saw that, you know, it's a quantitative analysis. We had a nationally representative sample capturing one in three schools across the country, um, representative of affluent areas, poor areas, single sex schools, rural areas, this sort of thing. Uh, the survey data uh, is linked to objective data on high-speed broadband availability. Um, so that was uh, quite unique at the time. Then in terms of the limitations, needless to say, we're relying here on principals reports. Um, so there are perceptions in a sense, not students or teachers directly involved. So it was like how principals themselves viewed the, viewed the situation at the time. And, um, you know, we felt that that was valid in the sense that principals were, were informed um, in that uh, there was much more engagement at the time with principals, with their staff and students, even uh, above and beyond a, a normal um, 
school operational time and and of course principals themselves were making the decision were the key decision makers at this time in terms of how do do we provide a continuity of education um, I'd mentioned the various approaches we had to catchment areas of schools. So they're imputed rather than directly observed. We don't have maps of the catchment geographies of the various schools. Um, and we could only judge these sort of radiuses based on, on, on service, um, national service of transport and, and school attendance. Um, we have, it was a one shot uh, survey cross-sectional data. So we're just emphasizing associations rather than causality here. Um, and there is likely to be important omitted variables in this analysis. For example, school ethos um, and culture and things like that, which has been shown to be very important for um, student engagement uh, during uh, periods of you know, uh, distance learning and sort of emergency remote teaching and, and crisis um, times. In terms of the implications of policy, well, um, the findings of this uh, analysis from an educational quality point of view might be supportive of these very expensive um, policies to provide high-speed broadband infrastructure uh, universally in country uh, across countries across rural areas um, for households needless to say as well as schools um, and in Ireland uh, you know this is intended to be remedied by the national broadband plan and um, but there's also some you need to say pushback on, on these uh, policies too from from the costing point of view so this study doesn't do a complete cost benefit analysis, but certainly from the educational quality uh, evidence that we were presenting here, it would be supportive of, of these kinds of um, massive infrastructure um, investments. And then in terms of the practical uh, side of things, we looked at those various distance teaching approaches, the six ones that I've met, uh, you know, showed on that sort of web illustration um, and and, and then the regression modeling showed that live video was the most effective um, tool for uh, maintaining uh, a level of, of student engagement, uh, at least in this period, um, which, you know, the bandwidth would require high speed broadband, maybe, and, and that sort of thing. So the conclusions, um, principals had perceived a general decline in student engagement um, during COVID-19 school build, build, building closures. Our statistical modeling um, suggests that the reduction in engagement was more likely among schools located in areas characterized by low coverage of high speed broadband. And um, this may be partly explained by a lower probability of reduced student engagement found for schools that employed live online video applications for most or all classes in their teaching. Um, so I'll leave it there for now and um, welcome any comments, uh, questions or suggestions. And I do apologize uh, about the um, various technical challenges I had um, in, in that delivery. So um, I think there is, thanks all. Okay, so we have a couple of comments in the uh, chat and I I'd mentioned the, the 43 billion which is astounding distance education paper based yeah so does this occur um yes there's certainly in the qualitative um in the qualitative interviews with principals there was uh depends on the teacher style and, and, and the school's approach but in rural areas in country areas there was uh you know, the postman was very busy in terms of delivering uh, worksheets and uh, parcels and, and that sort of thing. So there was worksheets delivered and returned by students. I've, you know, at the time, um, the school premises, they couldn't, uh, you know, 
deliver these back to the to the school premises as 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 parents or anything like that. So it was all done via via post and and these particular folders that some schools employed, um, which I don't think was a deal, but. When I was growing up, uh, we were still using worksheets and textbooks and, and that sort of thing. So <laughs> done, done us no harm, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was the... yeah, it's crazy, really, though, isn't it? It seems crazy, but uh, yeah, no, thank you. It's interesting. It is a realistic sort of thing to think about, though, because we've at work, we've pondered um, what do you do for students who are in jail? For example, right. I know we're talking about tertiary here. Yeah, people in jail cannot have any access to the internet, and I know that um, there are those in Australia um, who explore, have created sort of offline learning management systems and and the like. But again, yes, it requires the electronic means. So it's not really paper based anymore, but but there's something else if if a system wants to engage as many students and acts and give student as many access to their education. It's very interesting. Yeah. About and we heard plenty, sorry, sir, as well of, of I don't know if this is the case in jail, but <laughs> um of, of students using their phones. They didn't necessarily have the devices or even the internet, but there was text messages or you know, you can get a little bit, you can get your email on, on smartphones. Would that be something that you've experienced as well? Yeah, that'd be quite normal. It would actually. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, Sarah, before the call, was telling me about how uh, in Australia and the outback and things like that, even the radio is quite a, it can be certainly in the past, a, a medium for, for education, which kind of blew my mind. But I know <laughs> in, in, um, in Ireland, we had sort of celebrities that emerged from TVs, you know, the school or initiatives by the national broadcaster to have um, lessons for particular times for primary school um, kids and secondary school kids. Um, don't know about the radio. I don't think it was on the radio, but certainly they became celebrities here and, and even uh, for uh, PE and keeping people physically active. Uh, there was a number of influencers that, that certainly rose to stardom uh, via that channel too. We certainly had uh, Greta in Australia, like for really remote communities, there's certainly uh, radio, when we say radio, not your normal radio, but uh, like a CV radio, whatever whatever it was. And, uh, and perhaps I'm showing my age, but I certainly remember in primary school having a big radio speaker box mounted to the wall. And then once a week, there would be one of our lessons would come through the speaker. It was like a national broadcast thing or something. Yeah. So it was really a Perfect. form of distance education. There could be schools right around the country at that. It was like a synchronous event where everyone would stop and listen to the lesson being mm -hmm. transmitted via the, via the radio or whatever it was that this big, I don't know where it came from, but some big speaker on the wall. Um, it was That's amazing. <laughs> and it's kind of charming as well to think of yeah. the olden days <laughs> and yeah. everyone doing it together at the one time. That's amazing. Yeah, it's sort of a form of distance education. I mean, an early form of distance. So the evolution was then perhaps what you what you described there was the the paper based because I did a postgraduate here in Melbourne at, D at Deakin University, who's an early distant education adopter, and they used to bundle up the course material and send it in the post. And if you wanted a library book, you could get the library book delivered and turn up on your front door. It was a distance education model, correspondence, they used to call it in that day. It was sort of the radio, then the paper-based. Um, but again, it was probably 25 years ago. I don't yeah, know yeah. anyone where they're sending out paper-based material now. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. at the time of the pandemic, there was the safety worries, you know, about... So, yeah. Like we couldn't be engaged because staff buildings were closed down and things like that. So it was that dimension to it too, I suppose. Yeah. Mutoa, you had a question, I believe? Yes, I want comment? to say uh, thank you very much for that fascinating presentation. Uh, broadband 
internet is uh, something that excites me quite a bit because uh, when it was introduced in Australia uh, at about uh, 2013, uh, it was a very, very hot uh, political issue mm. because uh, there were people who supported the whole idea of a broadband internet and there are those who prefer to stick to the old model. Uh, so I, I, I find any, any research to do with the home broadband fascinating. Uh, my two comments I want to ask is one, um, in terms of uh, in terms of having broadband, I suppose that if if parents don't have broadband, then they have something like ADSL, and um, yeah, and, and that is of course much much slower than uh, broadband internet. And on account of that, uh, they are likely going to suffer a lot of frustration in terms of yes. uh, dropping out and you know not not being able to. Uh, stream any videos or anything like that. So um, I know your, your your issue was trying to find out about engagement and uh, you only got responses from principals. Uh, maybe yeah. uh, as a follow-up study, we might want to see whether there could be an another response from other people uh, other than just principals. Uh, but the other, the other thing I was also going to ask is whether um, because that was at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, now that the pandemic is nearly behind us, how much is the broadband being stressed and emphasized, <coughs> being taken as a, as a good way of, you know, communicating, educating, and uh, carrying out educational uh, programs? Yeah. Um, so the first point you make about technology frustration, and um, that's certainly valid, and even you saw me a little bit flustered in this presentation, but I suppose the cohort of young people, um, and they certainly instant, uh, you know, sort of short attention spans and a need for instant gratification, in a sense, is, is very important, you know, important, and even in terms of, you'll see, possibly the case with you guys as well. But what happens is a lot of broadband companies are now advertising this continuity of service. So say even your uh, broadband goes down in the house, if it's Vodafone providing your broadband wirelessly and your broadband goes down, they're, they're advertising um, you know, that it will be continued through 4G, 5G or whatever other means. And um, so there's, you know, frustration is certainly a topic and, and I'll tell you from other research that I've done it's more the older people that get very fed up um, with technology very readily and just rubbish it um, if there is breaks in, in service and, and, and dropping out uh, in terms of, of their attention span but yeah you're you're absolutely right it is a risk um, and, and certainly um, hopefully I suppose will improve it in the future of course with the move from copper to fiber and all of these things and um, and then you mentioned in terms of the beginning of the pandemic the, the context that we were we were in there and, and and hopefully um the pandemic being in the rear view mirror yes there is this sense of hopefully it's behind us and there won't be events that require um distance learning I suppose the sense is we don't know what the future holds. Obviously, pandemics are more of a threat now, um, but also climate change. And we've had a lot of um, adverse weather events, storms and um, things like that, which might in the future feature more as emergent, maybe more at a local level or a state level as emergency occasions where distance learning and this practice might need to be switched on overnight. So to prepare for those events, broadband is certainly, um, you know, in homes still, um, you know, very much felt as a backup tool in those events. But also I'd say there's, in terms of the working world of Ireland, there's been a major shift to distance working. And the cost of living in cities like Dublin is outrageous. We have a massive shortage of housing, particularly for young people. And um, 
the cost of renting is, is outrageous. So what we're finding, and hopefully maybe it could be in the census, the next census, we'll see maybe a shift away from the urban centres to rural areas. And I have been one of those people who've moved to Connemara, which is just stone walls and sheep. And I have to go into the office once a week, um, which is a four hour journey, but I, but I do it to live out in this rural area. And I've ordered broadband in December and it still hasn't come. So what I do is I go to a digital hub in the village and these have sprung up and you're finding more and more people are taking renting a desk in, in these digital hubs. But I would like to have my own broadband in the house, needless to say, <laughs> um, rather than operating on, on, on the very poor phone signal and 4G reception. So um, I think we've things have changed radically um, and the justification of these costs the public perception of the, this has changed and, and is um we don't like taxes of course but uh, it's not as begrudged maybe as it was prior to the pandemic certainly access to broadband um, perhaps not even broadband i don't have access to broadband and I will probably never get it. The fibre company is not going to do it. But um, uh, it, it, it's it's almost like access to running water. It's becoming yeah. an essential component in modern life, really, isn't it? Almost. It's getting that way. Um, it was like the electri electrification, that's a difficult word, of, yeah. of the rural areas. Um, this sort of r rollout of, of fibre to the cabinet or fibre to the home. Um, and that took quite a bit of time here in Ireland, but you'd think there is now protocols and precedent of that from electricity or, or water, but, uh, you know, technology is a whole different uh, ball game, I'm guessing. And then there's talk about these sort of satellite provision of you don't even need the cables anymore. But then the question is who operates the satellite and if it's, a tech billionaire or whatever and he decides to turn it off then we're left at their behest and power and control and we do need our own uh, supply on the ground i think those are some of the arguments yeah so lots of lots of questions but in the meantime getting to some state where we all have access right. your your um your uh research is very important. Angela, would you like to? Take a I just, um, I'm in Wellington in New Zealand, just so you know. <laughs> Tea is being cooked while I'm in here. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, this is it's very interesting because I think our journey is probably similar but different. Um, and we're still in it. I don't, don't believe what you see in the news. We're still in it where schools are open one day, gone the next because teach everyone's getting sick. Um, and so I would have thought coming out of the first year, there were so many good things. There's a lot of bad things because we had the same issues, homes with no internet access, schools, you know, children with no devices or only one device in the house and very bad internet access. So it was whoever had the biggest bit of work to do would do it. There, um, there was a lot to be learned, I think, which I don't know where it's gone because it, we still seem to be in that same situation. There would be some benefits, I think, that the government could have invested more heavily in education, ensuring that everybody had some sort of access because they're still left in the lurch now. If the school, like, say, different year levels are sent home from different schools because of staffing shortages or too many people. So what do they do? They go home with worksheets or – and then it's just – we are – and I know that we're probably the same as um, everywhere else that we did have um, pack outs of paper stuff for primary schools, mm. um, even though we, they weren't supposed to. They eventually let the schools open and parents could drive by and get a pack. And then there was a big post out to everybody and parents became teachers overnight. And we had the TV thing as well, which was I quite enjoyed watching. So because they had some of the actually TV actors presenting, I think it doesn't make any difference, makes it more interesting. But there's, I think there were such a lot of good ideas and good things that actually happened. Um, and schools looking at blended ways of teaching so that I don't need to say have um, maths in the secondary school situation, I don't have to say five periods of um, didactic teaching or whatever it might be. I could probably have two a blended way if so there's a lot of stuff online and then when I'm with you it's a, more of a tutorial and we get into really discussing stuff rather than 
Um, and that was my hope, but I don't think we've got there. And I think that the whole issue of actual internet access is the same as it was before, because it's a, it comes down to what the household can afford. Yeah. Uh, so it yeah. is about- So more, even if you have all yeah. of the yeah. technology there, mm. if you have the best fiber at the end of the day, if you can't adopt it, if you can't That's subscribe, right. What yeah. good is it um, yeah. for? Yeah, and there is a debate in Europe as to what does affordable broadband mean? Mm. Like what, you know, what sort of subscriptions? Is there going to be a sort of mandatory obligation on private companies to provide mm. what they deem to be affordable broadband? But of course, you have massive differences in cost across all of those countries. Um, so it is a live debate. And, and for some for some very poor um, students, there was, you know, the provision of dongles, those sort of data yes, sticks yeah, and things yeah. like that. Um, but I suppose there was a sense that this was all very temporary. And then, you know, we thought <laughs> in our workplace that, the offices would be closed for you know two weeks maybe uh, and then now sure we're all working from home but that's different to school but, I'm, still um, <laughs> I'm still at home I'm still at home because yeah. uh, you know because everybody's still getting sick and I don't want to catch it because I've got people here who um, have got other stuff going on so it's kind of like that's not what I expected either I thought I'd and be I know the Australian here. and New Zealand governments had very different approaches to how they tackled um, yeah you know, the lockdowns mm. were yeah. more severe and some and border control. So all of those things are issues in a, in a pandemic mm. environment. Mm. Yeah. But I think that one of the things you said, and okay, you know, I, Jen. I, I think <laughs> that the that broadband is um, it, it should be like electricity and water. It's a, it's a thing that it's a everybody, service in modern life. Every, yeah. Everybody needs it. I mean, you know, when you travel now. Um, for me, I, it's, it, I need to be connected, even though you're on holiday or whatever, because it's a way of keeping in touch with family instead of sending postcards and stuff like that the old days. Or paying a fortune for a phone call. Us, yeah. or, or like online banking yes. nowadays and yeah. e-government. Yes. So there's mm. the bank branches are closing in rural areas and uh, yeah. Yeah. Th things like that. So if our lives, you know, need to, we have to be online, then certainly, as you mm. say, it's a, an essential service and, and old people are again are kind of falling through the cracks and some, and mm. some of that um, transition, I think. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that you, you have similar issues, but slightly different uh, yeah. issues Sorry. as well. I'm going to have to um, draw it to a close. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank it's you. been really interesting. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all for having me. And, um, you know, do catch up with me if you have any other comments or queries. Many, many thanks, Greta. Really appreciate your time. I hope you have a good day today. And thank you to Angela and Mutuota and Abhishek. And um, I put the link to the YouTube channel that Odla has. So hopefully within the week, we'll have this recording up there. So you can okay. watch it. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye for Thanks. now. Bye-bye.